The Supreme Court has taken up a lot of really substantial cases that could fundamentally transform aspects of the United States, things like democracy with the case of Moore v. Harper. But there is a pair of cases that they've taken up, which is also really important, that hasn't gotten as much attention as the other big cases. Now, these cases... They have to do with Section 230, and I think that a lot of people are apprehensive about talking about this particular subject because it is very confusing because nobody really knows what the true takeaway would be in the event the Supreme Court struck down Section 230. We've heard a lot about this. We've heard critiques about Section 230 from the left and the right, and the implications of its demise aren't really known, but one thing that is for sure is that it would radically change the internet. And odds are it would be changed for the worse as opposed to the better. So what exactly is the Supreme Court looking at? Well, Mike Babirnez of Yahoo News explains the Supreme Court this week announced it will take up a pair of cases that could fundamentally change the legal foundations of the Internet. Both cases ask justices to consider how far protections that shield websites and social media companies from legal liability over what users post to their platform should go. Those protections were created in a portion of the Communications Decency Act of 1996 known as Section 230, a provision that has been called the 26 words that created the internet. Section 230 did two crucial things. It established that companies operating websites or social media platforms could not be held legally responsible if their users post content that breaks the law. It also granted them the right to curate, edit, and delete user content as they see fit. So suffice to say, the internet in its current state exists specifically because of Section 230. Without Section 230, the internet might look like a very different place. Now, as I alluded to earlier, both Democrats and Republicans have critiqued Section 230, even though Donald Trump has been particularly vocal in his criticism. But the Democrats who oppose Section 230 claim that websites should be held more culpable if violent extremism is festering on their website, if the proliferation of misinformation on their website continues. Whereas Republicans don't like the second provision of Section 230, specifically the one that gives social media websites the power to delete and curate content, um, they don't like that because they claim that these websites all have a liberal bias and it leads to the censorship of conservatives. Now, that critique from Republicans is not really founded by data. You know, leftists also get banned from social media websites frequently as well. They just don't whine about it as much. But conservatives in particular, they get a ton of traction on websites like Facebook, where the left just isn't able to compete. And they also dominate YouTube as well, although I don't have data to back that up. But just for argument's sake, you can see that there are different arguments against Section 230. Democrats are against one portion of Section 230, and conservatives are against another portion of Section 230. There's two sections of 230, and, you know, there's reasons for both sides to be against it, at least what we've heard. Now, both of the cases that the Supreme Court has taken up, they have to do with families who are suing these tech giants, Twitter, and Google in particular, because a member of these families fell victim to extremists. Now, the families are arguing in these lawsuits that websites should be held legally liable if extremism proliferates on their platforms and they don't take action to stop it. You could read more about this on the SCOTUS blog post about this. Now, the Supreme Court could go either way. They could side with the families and claim, yes, these websites, these tech giants in particular, should have done more to prevent extremism that led to the deaths of these families' uh, victims. And they can also take it in a different direction. They can say, well, actually, there's already too much content moderation, or they could just strike down Section 230 altogether. The question is, what does that mean for the internet going forward? And really, nobody really knows. All we can do is speculate, but odds are, it would mean less freedom on the internet if the Supreme Court in any way decided to take on Section 230 and declare it 
unconstitutional, either fully or partially. Many communications law experts fear that a decision throwing out Section 230 would create chaos in one of the world's most important industries as companies attempt to quickly react to a sudden and drastic change to the legal landscape. They argue that because few companies would be able to endure the new financial risk of lawsuits over user-generated posts, venues for free speech online would rapidly erode or even disappear. Other sites might go the opposite direction and issue moderation altogether, which would create space for their platforms to turn into cesspools of objectionable content. Kyle Barr of Gizmodo states, if a company like Twitter suddenly finds that it is held liable for each post on its site, the company says that its options would become limited to either folding entirely or conducting extreme amounts of vetting and content moderation, much more than already goes on. This, of course, isn't exactly what conservatives want, or it's at least what they claim that they don't want. So envision that being the product, the end result of the Supreme Court ruling with regard to Section 230. What does this mean for independent media, YouTube shows like my own? Could independent media exist in a post-Section 230 America? I genuinely don't know. Or if it does exist, would it exist in a different fashion? Would this force YouTube to hire content creators, for example, so that way they're not just independent contractors, so that way they have more direct control over what we as YouTubers say? Would Twitter take up a lot more bans? It's so hard to say, and it's horrifying to think about the implications of what this would look like. But as the article alluded to, it could go in the opposite opposite direction as well, which wouldn't necessarily be ideal. For example, David Ingram of NBC News explains, alternatively, the court could also create a situation in which tech companies have little power to moderate what users post, rolling back years of efforts to limit the reach of misinformation, abuse, and hate speech. So what would that look like in reality? Well, in the event a user, for example, makes a death threat online to a politician, that would disempower websites like Twitter or YouTube from suspending that user. They would have to allow the extremism to go on to that website. They would be unable to do anything about that. It would be in the hands of the local police department where that individual made that complaint. Does that sound like a really good alternative as well? To give them no tools whatsoever to get rid of violence and extremism so youtube would not be able to remove an isis beheading video i mean do you understand how both extremes when it comes to section 230 they don't provide a better alternative to the internet today there are certainly issues with the internet as it is but certainly it isn't that there is too much freedom on the internet it's that there isn't enough freedom but conservatives as much as they complain about section 230 haven't been very helpful in activists fight to strengthen the internet freedom for example they have held up the confirmation of gg sone to the fcc for almost a year now gg sone is a strong supporter of net neutrality which would create more internet freedom because remember net neutrality is an issue where it would prevent internet service providers like comcast at&t from picking and choosing which websites they want to prioritize so they couldn't choose to strangle or throttle traffic to their competitor if at&t wants to launch you know some alternative streaming service they couldn't then in turn throttle traffic to netflix so that way it becomes unbearably slow and people opt for at&t's alternative they can't do that with net neutrality but under trump's leadership ajit pai repealed net neutrality and now if gg zone were to be confirmed the fcc would have the makeup to actually restore net neutrality but conservatives have fought against this at every step of the way claiming that gg zone is too woke and she wants to censor conservatives when she wants to do the opposite she wants to enhance freedom on the internet and even if net neutrality were to be restored there's other things that need to be done to rein in big tech because i do believe that they have too much power right but not too much power with regard to section 230 not too much immunity with regard to section 230 we need antitrust legislation and amy klobuchar of all people actually proposed very strong antitrust legislation but the vote on this in the senate has stalled thanks to chuck schumer now he keeps promising that there's going to be a vote but it keeps getting postponed longer and longer and longer so things like that need to stop but just imagine for a second the situation 
where the Supreme Court, these six conservative justices, have unlimited authority to remake the internet as they see fit. Well, we don't have to imagine it because they actually do have that power. It's just a matter, a matter of whether or not they'll exercise that power and reshape, strike down, or uh, partially strike down Section 230. The internet could turn into a very dark and dystopian place. And it's already a pretty dark and dystopian place. It's not perfect, right? But things could get a lot worse quickly if Section 230 weren't in place. That is needed for internet freedom. And if they do away with this, then things are going to get really bad. And so I would encourage everyone to pay attention to this case because it is one of the most important cases that the Supreme Court has taken up this term.